In just a few seconds, we're going to share another amazing leader with you. But before we get started, I want to invite you to join the Sensei Leader Movement. I founded this global community to support and develop human-centric leaders, leaders who care, leaders like you. Our first level membership is free and always will be. You'll have access to online workshops, special members-only events, preferred rates on coaching, and a lot more. And if you join today, you'll get free downloads of all three books in my Eight Strategies for Leaders series. You know, the best leaders always want to improve, and we're here to help. Go to slmjoinfree.com and join the movement today. Today, we're talking to one of our heroes on the front lines of community leadership. Without our first responders, we'd be in a lot of trouble. And thankfully, whenever we are in trouble, these leaders are here to help us, right? So today, we're talking to one of those remarkable heroes, Todd DeVoe. People who inspire, empower, and guide us to our very best. Leaders who are walking the walk. Your host, leadership activist, author, and founder of the Sensei Leader Movement, Jim Bouchard. Todd DeVoe's involvement in emergency response, emergency management, education, and volunteer management started in about 1989, and he became a volunteer firefighter in upstate New York. So we'll talk about that, I'm sure. In 1991, Todd joined the Navy. He became a hospital corpsman. After his service, Todd served as an emergency medical responder, EMT, in some of the toughest parts of L.A. County and later became the emergency services coordinator for the city of Dana Point. Today, Todd teaches at Coastline College, California State University, Fullerton, and the University of California, Irvine. I'm getting alphabet soup deficiency syndrome here. He's the director, emergency management for Titan HST, and he's the host of the leading emergency management show in the podcast space. It's called EM Weekly. Todd, that's a that's a hell of a resume we're starting with there. Uh, yeah, keep busy, that's for sure. That's what it's all about. Leadership is service. So what got you interested in, in uh, emergency services in the first place? Well, you know, it's, it's going to sound so cliche, but I think it's true. I started as a kid, right? And mm-hmm. you know, being a Boy Scout, right? And and getting to do a lot of cool stuff in the Boy Scouts. Um, in upstate New York, uh, I, I got to go up to, uh, you know, the Adirondacks and camp and hike and hit the, hit the uh, a lot of the peaks up there. You know, I even got to go up to Maine and do uh, one of the uh, canoe trips up there and got to see a lot of the world. Part of that, you know, I was doing this was, you know, learning how to serve serve your community, right? It's not right. just about camping. It's about doing service projects and things. You know, like we built a, uh, one of the earliest things I did, I think I was 14 or 15 when we did this, is we helped build one of the uh, parks, uh, like the old-fashioned wooden, um, you know, playground, jungle gym type things that we built. Oh, like yeah, that. yeah. Yeah, back in the 80s. Um, so that was like one of the big projects that we did. And we actually did the fundraising for it and stuff like that and, and, and put together the team. as some one of the kids' Eagles projects uh, that we had uh, that we worked on. Well, that's and, impressive uh, because the reason I got drummed out of the scouts is because all I cared about was the camping. <laughs> yeah, right? You know, I mean, that's me too for that matter. Sadly. But, so. but uh, um, and I think that just kind of instilled that service, you know, right, to, right. you know, and um, I, I grew up in an area that had volunteer fire departments, you know, when I turned 18, it was just a, an assumption that we would join the fire department, you know, in our family. And um, I did. And my dad had a restaurant. It's a deli. Um, if you guys, for people who don't know what a deli is, back East deli is different than delis elsewhere. It's you know, like <laughs> sandwiches and stuff and, right. and whatnot. And uh, right next door to our deli was one of the fire stations. And so, it was just convenient, I suppose, to join that. And my dad supported it. So if we ever had a call, I was able to leave and, and go around on the calls. And I really got interested in firefighting and whatnot, becoming an EMT. And uh, during that time period, um, the first Gulf War uh, broke out and I got patriotic and decided to go and do my part. Um, I got in and by the time I got done with boot camp and whatnot, the war was over. So uh you know, so much for, for going to war, but, uh, that's right. It's not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's like, yeah. Right. You know, yeah. and, um, well, you know, when I got out, I, I, my, my goal was to become a firefighter, you know, and, and so I was going through that process and I was actually in the uh, process with the uh, LA County fire department, uh, when I got the Dana point job and, uh, and I'm going to rewind a little bit. <clears throat> One of the jobs I had when I was working EMS was I worked, um, as uh, the medical logistics chief, uh, for, some of the larger fires that we had in California. And I really got interested in that coordination piece. And my, uh, at the same time I was going, using my GI bill, going to school 
I was getting a degree in public administration and um, the process really interested me. So, you know, reading Max Weber and, and Singer and, and those guys um, on processes and, and the, the, the philosophical aspect of, of what, what it means to lead uh, really interested me. And so it was, it was really that connection between your public service um, and, and like the neat part of processes and, and, and putting things together and, and building uh, teams and, and whatnot. So that's why I was really interested in, in the emergency management side of, of what we do here as in public safety. Yeah, we, it sounds like we have some some parallels because my interest in uh, firefighting started when I was when I was young too. I was uh, I was in high school and they had the the uh, junior division for the volunteer department at that time, and that's how I got into it. And then eventually, yeah, I ended up uh, being an EMT and doing fire rescue and whatnot. But then I I got out of it. I I thought I was going to do it for a career, but I I didn't stick it out. And then one of my greatest regrets that you fulfilled is was serving in the military. I I didn't do that. I was busy messing up my life at the time. <laughs> So there you go. You know, it, it's interesting because when I talk about, you know, a past with, with fire service and whatnot, inevitably the issue of command and control comes up. And I go around preaching that command and control is dead. You know, the age of command and control is dead. But there are certain times when we need to apply that that command and control technique. And my contention always is that even in a situation like the military or like a fire service or police service, something like that, um, you're only going to follow somebody's orders if you trust them, if you respect them. Is it, you think I'm way off base or you have the same experience? Um, there's the same experience. You know, it's funny because, you know, we'll go to, and, and I, it's, it's partly joking, but there's a lot of truth to this. Um, you know, when a lieutenant walks in the room and says, hey, boys, this is what we're doing, and he lays out all this stuff, and he walks out, and we all look at our chief and say, is that what we're really doing? <laughs> right. you, know? Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's like, okay, Yes, sir. Let's see. Yes, sir. They look at the chief for the actual orders, and there's some truth to that because the the, the ability for the senior enlisted off, you know, to be able to um, you know interpret what the officer really means. Not saying that the, that the junior officers um, are bad or what they do, but there, there's also the inexperience that that the levels there. And some of us, you know, have been in the military longer by years uh, than the junior enlisted guys. So mm. um, after after it takes a little bit for them to prove themselves to us, I guess for lack of a better term, I don't, you know. And for the officers that are out there, I hope you guys don't take offense to it, but it's just that that's the truth of it, right? And, no, no, no. It makes a lot of sense because the, then the flip side, right, is always that. You know, I always remember those old World War II movies, right, where there's a green lieutenant that gets his first command, right, and gets thrown into his first battle, doesn't know what the hell's going on, and so the grizzled old sergeant always bails him out, right, because he's been there, and he has the respect and the trust of the of the other troops. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, that, you know, you hit right on a, one of the key points that we're always trying to emphasize around here, that, you know, true leadership, genuine leadership really doesn't have anything to do with rank or title or position of authority, right? You have to earn, you, anyone can make you, for instance, an officer, but you have to earn the respect of the troops in order to be a leader, no? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's funny, you, you, we, I talk about this a lot when I teach and we talk about leadership and, mm -hmm. and um, there's always the, the, the given leadership position. So like you said, you, you become a manager or you get, you know, promoted to whatever. Um, and that's what the, the leadership, when I say leadership, the, the, uh, executives will look at, look at you no matter what you're doing, whether it's business or, or government or whatever, right? right? So you get promoted to this management position. There it is. Mm -hmm. and, and then you walk in and then there's the guys who, who you used to work with, right? Who, you know, know what you did when you were not a manager, right? And they kind of have that look at you. And then there's the, you know, the people who don't know you from Adam and go to, I trust this guy, do I make trust the decision? Yeah, so yeah. You constantly have to be able to prove yourself um, to your subordinates and then also to those who you report to, right? I mean, exactly. so, mm -hmm. so as you get the job because of your experience or you get the job because, you know, or your resume, if you will, right? You get the job because, you know, you, you're the best out of the group that applied for it, if, you know, that type of thing. Um, and, and you still have to continue to learn. And so I think that's really important. And then you have to also trust your locker room leaders, right? And if you think about, uh, you know, football, for instance, you might have your, your guy like Tom Brady, right? And I'm, I'm picking on him just because he's in the news a lot right now. And I'm sure he's a great leader. Um, but you get, you get a guy like Tom Brady, who's everybody's going to listen to because he's the quarterback, he's the franchise guy. But there's also the guys in the locker room that really make it happen, right? You know, like the, the guys who are afraid to go talk to Tom Brady because he is who he is. Um, and there's a guy, you have the guys who are, you know, the backup quarterback, if you will, or the you know, the guy who um, has been in the league for a bunch of years, but right. is still 
just a journeyman, if you will. Sometimes those are the guys that make the better football coaches, right? Um, and because they know the system and, and they're able to talk to people on a level that they understand. So I think there's importance to understand that. And then kind of building on that, as somebody who gets promoted into a leadership position, um, you, you know, understanding who your locker room leaders are and taking them and be and, 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 and be friends with those guys and, and have because they'll do a lot for you if they trust you as well. And I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't agree. Them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And that's why, you know, we make a pretty hard semantic distinction between what well, we've created a character of the evil manager, right? And and you, you just said it perfectly. I mean, anyone can make you a manager and, is the, and not always for the right reasons. I mean, a lot of times it's deserved, but sometimes it's nepotism or sometimes it's political savvy or whatever gets you in that position. But only the people you serve can make you a leader. And, you know, you've done this for a long time now. And, you know, I'd, li- I'd like to like to hear from you, you know, how obviously, you know, you've been able to earn the respect and the trust of the people you serve. And, um, you know, I can hear from your voice and I listen to a couple of your podcasts and, and, uh, you know, the enthusiasm comes through, you know, the authenticity comes through, you know, how, how do you, how do you think you've been able to, to earn and maintain that trust and respect through, through all these different positions? Mistakes. (laughs) That's always a part of the game, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I, I have learned more from my missteps than I ever have from anything that's gone right. And I, I, uh, I tend to beat myself up. Um, and I think, most, I think most people do, right? I don't think I'm, I'm anything. I, know, I think the better people do. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, yeah, so I, I tend to look at my mistakes and I, and I it's funny, I, I look through all these positive things that people say, you know, on, on the podcast or whatever, and the things that I, I dwell on are the, are the negative remarks, because I want to mm-hmm. see what, what am I doing wrong and how can I improve. And I, and I take a look at that, and, and I really grow from that, because I take a look at, like, you know, say people say positive things about you or whatever, and that's great. Um, but it's when the people are saying negative things about me, um, that, I, that I, I don't dwell on it necessarily in a negative way. I, I dwell on it in the aspect of going, what can I do to be better? What can I do? Well, you pay, you're paying attention to it, right? That's the yeah, thing. Yeah, to, to make those people, those negatives um, into a positive. Uh, that's the, uh, the thing that I think is important. No, that's the key. You know, I hate it when people just come out with the cliche and they say, yeah, well, in fact, when I was boxing, it was funny. I had a cool trainer and he always, usually when my face was, you know, all mashed in, he'd say something like, uh, you always learn more when you lose, Jim. Don't worry about it. Of course, then he'd turn around and say, well, some days you don't freaking feel like learning anything, right? Um, but I always hated that cliche that all all mistakes, all losses were a lesson. They are, but you have to go in, you have, you have some work to do. You have to go in there and wring those lessons out, don't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, uh, you know, I have a friend of mine, a, a, a great guy, and, and his name is Brian Colburn, and, and uh, he's part of the Ian Weekly as well. And uh, we bounce stuff back and forth uh, with each other all the time. It's also important to have that person where I can go to, to Brian going, dude, I got this, like, you know, this criticism. Am I really this way? You know, is it, is it you know, or is it just a perception that somebody else has? And, and we can talk that through. And I do the same for him, right? You know, um, on, on mistakes that we make, we, and, and kind of you know make that plan to be to be better. And I'll tell you a, a true story. So, um, I've I had a a guy who I've known for years, and, and I like the guy. Um, and it's a, it was like a political thing, right? And I, I didn't support his political candidate, and so he. Uh, that happens he, too much these days. I know it. Yeah, and he just completely yeah. cut me out, like mm-hmm. completely. You know. And I'm like, holy crap, I never said anything negative about him personally or anything like that. I just didn't, and I don't really say anything negative about um, other candidates either. I, I try, to, try to stay pretty neutral right. on things, uh, but I just did not support his political view. And I was, I was talking to Brian, I'm like, is that, I mean, like, what did I do wrong here to, 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 to make him walk away? And I didn't blame, I didn't blame the other guy. You're going to look in the mirror what first. Yeah, yeah, right? You know, exactly. Um, and, and I think that's important. And it's also important to have that person that you can bounce things off of uh, that will take a, a uh, not a cheerleader, right? You don't want a cheerleader in your corner. You don't want a yes man. You, you want somebody who's yeah. going to look at you and say, yeah, this is where you screwed up. And this is how you can improve um, right. and, and do that continuous improvement. Hey, we're going to take a short break. We'll come back and I want to pick up. I want to learn more about EM Weekly and your, and your work there. And uh, really, really appreciate you being with us here today, Todd. Thank you so much. The research is bomb-proof. People perform at their best when and only when they know their leaders care, when they know their work has meaning, and when they have the chance to learn, grow, and develop. To accomplish this, we need to connect with the people we serve, the people who trust in our leadership. 
Leaders today need emotional intelligence, strong interpersonal skills, and an accurate sense of self-awareness. I'm Jim Bouchard, leadership activist and founder of the Sensei Leader Movement. The Sensei enjoys a very special relationship with students. It's one built on respect, trust, and loyalty. And these are also a leader's most valuable assets. I help you build these relationships. I work with you to help you inspire, empower, and guide your people to their very best. That's what the best leaders do, and that's what the Sensei does. My job is to help you be the Sensei, so you can lead your people to their very best and yours. Executive coaching, workshops, corporate training. Visit thesenseileader.com or call 207-751-4317 today to learn more. EM Weekly, hosted by today's guest, Todd DeVoe, is all about bringing news, interviews, discussing trends and issues that impact emergency management. It's perfect for all first responders, military, education, public safety, communications, disaster volunteer organizations, public health, humanitarian groups, NGOs, professionals, students, and researchers. EM Weekly also offers a blog for those who would rather read the transcripts and have access to additional content not discussed in the show. It's all free with the simple mission of strengthening the EM community. Listen at emweekly.com. That's emweekly.com. Hey, we're back with, with Todd DeVoe. Uh, among many other things, he's the host of EM Weekly, which is a great podcast for, for uh, first responders, emergency uh, medical service people, and, and whatnot. And what great experience. He's been sharing some terrific. God, your stories are terrific. Uh, we were talking about the politics. That's one of the biggest things uh, we're, in our workshops. That comes up all the time right now um, and at conferences, right? How do you deal with it? How do you manage it? And people are so hateful back and forth. And I, I'm with you. I, I, you know, I don't care. Someone could be 180 degrees, you know, different, different political views than me. But, you know, hey, we've got to work together. We've got to live together. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, the, the, the thing is, is like I, I actually like people who – have opposite views of myself. It's more and, interesting anyway, isn't it? <laughs> Sometimes. Well, but yeah, but it also challenges you to look at your view, right? And to mm-hmm. say, mm-hmm. you know, am I right? Right. You know, if you live in a, in an echo chamber, if you will, of course you're going to be right. Everybody's going to be. Well, you oh, can't God. because I'm, I'm right. So you exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. people forget we can both be I mean, right. Absolutely. I, but I was listening to a, a, uh, a book the other day. And I, I, gosh darn it, I forget the name of it. Um, but anyway, he was the, the guy was talking about um, having the uh, the rival, the, the the oh, it was a Simon Sinek book. That's that's oh uh, yeah yeah right. And he was talking about having the um, uh, a rival, uh, an arrival that you can you can respect, but mm-hmm. a rival nonetheless. Mm-hmm. And and he was telling the story about how he had this other guy who was a writer as well. And, and he just, every, you know, he wanted his book to be number one on, on the uh, New York Times bestsellers list. And when he was, he felt that he won. And he was talking about how there was really no, no winner there. But he was saying that that rival actually makes you better because it's someone who you can, that challenges you. Mm-hmm. And I thought about that time in high school. And I had this, this one guy who uh, was from a different school. And we rested in the same section. And, and him and I would go back and forth, and, and, it, and it made me a better wrestler knowing that I had to go against him in the sectionals uh, in order to go on to the States, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, uh, that, that, that rival right there always makes you better, and you don't have to let, dislike them as a person, even right. if you disagree with them. No, it's, it's a respect you, thing, you know? Right, yeah. and if, but if they can challenge you to think on, on the philosophical side of things, um, I think it's, you're better off. You know, it's cool that you brought up the wrestling because I was just going to ask you if you were a martial artist or a fighter or a black belt of some sort. Because and you are that obviously because wrestling is a terrific martial art. And uh, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, one t- years ago, I remember somebody challenged me one time because, and I was never I was horrible about this. I was never one of these guys that said I'm the best, I'm the best, and the best. I th- in fact, I think I was telling some other people in the group that they were the best. And they took umbrage to that. They said, well, you could offend some other people. I said, well, no, 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 no. You guys are the best. That's their problem to worry about them being the best. You know what I mean? And there's plenty of room. I, I've always had that philosophy that, you know, there's, there's plenty of room at the top. But it's the middle and the bottom that get really crowded sometimes. <laughs> Tell me more about EM Weekly. That's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool adventure you're doing there. Sure, sure thing. Yeah, so EM Weekly started four years ago um, as, a, as a podcast for um, – Basically, I, I brought it in for my students uh, where uh-huh. I teach. And it just from there, it just kind of 
people started listening to it, right? And uh, uh, and the you cool hope. part about it is, <laughs> yeah. every time I watch an episode, I hope I hope you're going to listen. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. You know, I, I figured I'd have 32 people a year, you know, or a semester listening mm-hmm. to it, and then that would be about it. Um, but it's 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 gotten bigger, and, and people have actually, you know, have, have reached out um, about the show, uh, have thanked me for doing the stuff, and 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 I'm humbled by that because it's not about me at all. It's really about the guests. I, I tried to make it about the guests. Right. Um, and it's also about bringing quality people to emergency managers from around the world. Right. And so exactly. that's what we try to do at EM weekly. No, that's the cool thing. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of bad things about technology these days too, but one of the great things is you, you just hit it. We can touch people all over the world. We can meet and, and listen to people all over the world. And I think that's cool. Let's talk about your teaching service too. Cause again, you, you're hitting on all cylinders here to me. That's, that's another one of the greatest expressions of leadership. Um, you know, when people really press me um, and, and I think we're, I think I'm going to be on your podcast too. I think Alex said, but sure. So yeah. I, I'll, I'll say it again then <laughs> when people <laughs> press me for, uh, you know, one, a uh, summary statement about leadership. I always say, well, leadership is sharing. A leader shares. And what better expression of that than teaching, huh? Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, I turned 50 in April. And, and you know, for, for most people, they go, that's not, that's not old. But in the world of, of emergency response, emergency management, I'm an old guy. And um, and in that aspect, I, I want to know that the next generation coming behind me, you know, those guys, the, the, the gals and guys that are, you know, in their 20s right now or, you know, are coming up behind me that are, are going to understand all the struggles that we had to, to, to get to where we are today mm-hmm. and learn from our mistakes. Right. And then hopefully they don't make the same, same mistakes. And there was this, there was an article that was talking about the, uh, the intellectual void that is occurring as emergency managers start to retire. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and I'm like, no, there, there's not there. The, I, I disagree with that wholeheartedly because there's so many people out there that are teaching the new generation coming up and, and still involved in emergency management through research, through writing, um, sharing the knowledge. Um, and, and even though they might not be in the emergency operations center any longer, um, they're actually still able to influence uh, the new generation coming up. And the students that are coming through our programs, they are unbelievable. They are great. Um, they, they are so smart, so well read, have a greater understanding of, of processes and how things work. Now, the, 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 the critique on them is that they don't have the world experience, but they'll get that, you know, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll of, get none that of us did it, Right. None and, of us did to start. With. Right. Absolutely. And then, you know, and our job as emergency managers and, and first responders that are, that are older, the captains, the chiefs and whatnot, is to keep mentoring the new kids as they come up you know, um, and, and learn from them as well. Because I, I, I honestly learn as much from my students when I teach uh, as I do, as they do for me. And sometimes I think more. No, amen. Abs- absolutely. I always used to tell my instructors, I said, y- you need to be selfish when you teach. And they'd look at me freakishly, you know, and I said, no, no, I'm serious. I said, because it, it's what you get out of it that, you know, creates the energy that you're going to reflect back to your students. And, and I'm glad you brought up that generational issue too, because we're hearing so much of that. And I think people in different industries will benefit from what you just said. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with us giving them the chance, isn't it? We've got to be open-minded, open-hearted about that. No. Absolutely. You know, there's emergency, I'm picking on emergency manager right now. There's Mm -hmm. some emergency managers out there that, you know, are very stingy with their time. And I understand. Um, But when I have young kids come up to me and talk to me about things, um, I'm more than willing to spend spend my time with them and, and go yeah. through and, and just, you know, I give them my personal cell phone. They can call to email me. LinkedIn, I say yes to almost everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I, I connect with them all the time. Matter of fact, when I was at the national conference a few years ago, when I say a few, uh, I didn't go to last year, so the year before last, um, I met a bunch of the kids um, and I actually spoke to a bunch of the college kids and it was funny because I felt like I had uh, little ducklings following me around because a bunch of them just kind of glommed onto me and went wherever I went and I was happy you know didn't I was not saying that in a negative way I just saying it was just kind of neat and it's humbling again to have these kids like want to learn from you it's just like a a very a very humbling experience and and I say this in, in in truth that if you are a good instructor and you have students that follow you to classroom to classroom just respect them and 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 understand that that it is a is a a great 
a great honor for you to be able to teach those kids and and take it seriously and take your responsibility uh, seriously as well. Oh, you know, we're so singing in harmony because you're absolutely right. It is a privilege and it is a humbling experience to have people trust, you know, in your leadership and your, you know, the only one, I, I'll tell you what, if we are ever in the same room doing a workshop together or a conference or something, uh, the, the thing about being stingy with time, I want to hit that because, you know, leaders and, and managers who want to be leaders, you've got to get over that. You know, I, I hear that all the time and I'm pretty blunt and brutal in these workshops because you know when someone says I don't have time to spend with the people you know down on the rank and file I said well you better damn well make it you know I said you don't want to be an undercover boss no no not at all it's so, funny I actually had a, a, a an administrative assistant and uh, she would she would actually pull me out and say oh hey, hey I have to talk to you about something really quick mm -hmm. and she'd pull me away um, because I I even though you look at me and I'm a little on the, on the chubby side, uh, when I, <laughs> when I go through some of these things, I, I don't eat at all. And she could see me starting to lose my energy and whatnot. And so she right. pulled me aside and put me in the room and make me have lunch or whatever, because yeah. I, I, I wouldn't leave until people didn't need me anymore. Oh, right. No, well, your, your friend, Simon Sinek, what, what is one of his books? Leaders eat last, right? Yeah. But the flip side of course, is that people, you know, when they're access, when you're accessing a leader, you want to make sure that you know, you're respectful of that time too. It's, it's awful that, um, sometimes, you know, someone just, that open door policy can get tricky, right? If someone's just taking advantage of that and not being respectful of time. But, but as leaders, no, we, we need to make, we need to make time for face-to-face -face time. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Hey, you know what? I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you one of the pressing questions. Of course, these, these episodes are evergreen. So who knows when someone, you know, listen to this five years and I say, what the hell are they talking about? But here we are facing the, the coronavirus, <laughs> right? And you're right in, you're in the, on the spear, you know, tip of the spear with, with this thing. Yeah. Right. And there's been interesting conversations going around, especially within the movement here, you know, how leaders are responding to this. What, what's your take? And, and if you're listening, you know, sometime in the future, don't worry about it because you're probably facing some other similar crisis. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, how, how do you think uh, the response has been and how should leaders respond when, when, uh, when we're facing something like this? Well, some of the stuff that really disappoints me is how both political parties um, in the United States right now um, are, are using it as a, as a political football. Oh, and it really amen. kind of irritates amen. me. Amen. They're cashing in on it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that, that just, I just want to get that out of the way because there are some decisions that are being made that are correct decisions that, uh, that the pundits are, are attacking and, and right. but we'll just leave that as it is. You know, I, I think, I think there's a lot of scared people and I think because information isn't flowing and I don't know if it's not flowing because they don't, they, they, they're not wanting to share it, which I, I really hope that's not the case. But I think that the, even the governments aren't a hundred percent positive on, on how to approach this. And that being said, when there's a, a, a vacuum of information, people start listening to conspiracy theorists or, or whatnot and then they start acting on their own. At this point, it's just a really severe cold. Mm -hmm. And um, if you take your typical steps that you take for flu and cold season, where you wash your hands, you do that stuff. Um, you know, if you feel like you're sick, social distance yourself. Um, you know, you, you're going to be you're going to be okay. Um, the there's a, a vaccine that has been created. Um, it's going through the process right now. It's, although the bad part about it, oh, it's not going to be out for 18 months. This is we're you know, recording this in, in March of. Uh, <laughs> It'll be out when it's over, right? <laughs> yeah, if, you know, um, but yeah. you know, it's like any 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 other kind of vaccine for a virus, and yeah. um, and like like any other bad flu or or whatnot. If you have underlying issues such as respiratory dis diseases or whatnot, right. um, you, you know, you, you you might succumb to it. So so is it bad? Yeah, it's terrible. You know, um. Should we take precautions? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that there are some things that we're doing on government wise, as far as like declaring an emergency, that people don't understand why we do these things. It's not necessarily because we have this, uh, you know, overwhelming number of, of victims at this point, but it, re it releases funding and, and other right. opportunities for us to be able to do things legally that we have to declare an emergency in order to open up those doors. And that's why we do a lot of that. Oh, I'm so glad you said that because I think that's one of the things that happened today when 
California declared the emergency. I think that was, a, from what I heard, a legal mechanism to, to keep one of the ships from coming to port or something. Absolutely. Like that. But, yeah. Yeah. But you know that what I really took away from that, though, and, and thank you for, for bringing that up, is the idea that, you know, in a crisis situation, when, when the poop's hitting the fan, that it's very important that leaders are as tr- transparent as possible, right? And to share information as openly as they can. You got to trust people. Yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. Because I mean, you know, there's some things that you don't, it's, it's a, it's a balance. Right. right. Mm-hmm. And then I say this because like there are some things you don't want to share because it might cause panic, but then there are things like you, if you don't share it, it might cause panic. So when you're yeah. sitting there at that yeah. table trying to make the decision, I've been there, right. I've, I've been in these mm-hmm. conversations and we've, back when we had the uh, H1N1 virus going through and, and, and having conversations. And, and, and I asked a lot of questions in there because I, I wanted to know what this decision, you know, means. Right. And there are some things that were triggers and whatnot that forces us to do certain things and whatnot. But, you, you know, being in there and I, I, again, I was not the decision maker, you know, the health department was, but I asked a lot of questions and understood where they're coming from because I wanted to know why we're making the decision we're making. Hey, Todd, thank you so much, Red. And, and you know what? If you don't mind, I, I'm going to put you at the top of the list. If when we have the coronavirus or the next, you know, H1N37 or whatever comes along, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have you back as the voice of reason. Is that is that okay? Absolutely. No, there's lots of cool things we need to talk about. So listen, why don't, why don't we wrap up? Tell people how to get in touch with you if, if you'd like them to. And uh and, and obviously, tell folks how to get to the EM Weekly because we're going to make sure we, we uh, share this with folks in our circles that, that um, are in emergency services and first responders, too. Sure thing, yeah. So EM Weekly, it's easy. It's emweekly.com, my, my webpage at Sitch Radio, and uh, that's our home of, of EM Weekly. Or you can find it on any of your podcast listening platforms, such as iTunes, uh, iHeartRadio, um, iTunes, or um, uh, what's this Spotify all, all of those yeah. things right Spotify. all those things yeah <laughs> I, I always forget all of those. there's like hundreds of them out there now um and oh, then yeah. as well if you want to email me directly I'm happy to hear from you it's you're really easy Todd my first name with two d's t-o-d-d at emweekly.com or uh, hook up with me on LinkedIn um I'm, I'm I'm on there a lot that's where I, I spend a lot of time um you know with, with it I love LinkedIn and uh I, I would I would love to hook up with you guys there and uh um, say hi. Todd, thanks so much for being, and thank you so much for your service to our community. It's my thank pleasure. You. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Walking the Walk. Please like and share. Our mission at the Sensei Leader Movement is to support and develop human centric leaders, leaders who put people first, leaders who inspire, empower, and guide people to their very best. Be part of the movement. Join and access all our free resources by visiting the senseileader.com. To book Jim or host your own event, call us at 207-751-4317.